Hi, my name is Derek Sivers, and you can tweet and email me here because I'm going to do a different format for this talk. I'm going to have these points down at the bottom of the screen in small points that are facts, not my opinion, but they're taken from all of these psychology studies. And I thought instead of coming up here and boring everybody with these detailed citations and the details of the test, I'm going to give you just the conclusions, but email me if you want the details. Okay, ready? Life is what? Anybody here? Fill in the blank. What word do you think belongs there? Just shout something out. Anything. Something else? Yeah, TEDxKL. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. <laughs> Your life is TEDxKL. Come on, another word. Anybody? Willpower? Okay. All right, some good answers. Let's try a few different... Let's try on a few different approaches. Let's try life is choice. Life is all about choice. You make a hundred little choices every single day, and any one of these choices don't seem like a big deal, but they shape your life. So who, what, and where you are now is because of the little choices you've made, and who, what, and where you will be is all up to the choices you will make. So it's a fair argument that life is choice, right? So if life is choice, how do you make good choices? Here's how. First, ignore logic, trust emotion. I'm telling you, these are facts, not opinions. What this is, okay, you know how you have these different parts of your brain, right? So the amygdala, the brain stem, is the one that handles instinct emotion. The prefrontal cortex is the part that handles logic and language and predictions. What's interesting is that the amygdala has been developing for eons and eons over all kinds of different uh, genres of species or whatever, but the prefrontal cortex is actually a pretty recent development, and it's not very well developed. That's why a $5 calculator can still outsmart the best mathematician. So what's interesting, though, is that everything you learn in life comes in and is processed by your prefrontal cortex, but is stored permanently as emotions and instincts in your amygdala. So the way to make good decisions is to actually trust your instincts, because it is the culmination of everything you've ever learned. Don't depend on your $5 calculator brain to make good decisions. Your instinct is actually much smarter than your logic. Besides, even when you say, uh, well, I've made a rational decision and I weighed all the pros and cons and I decided X. What it really means is you just liked X and you came up with a bunch of rational sounding reasons to explain your behavior. <laughs> that's, that's it's called confabulation. It's one of my favorite words. So ignore logic, learn to trust your emotion. It really is the culmination of everything you've ever learned. Next, seek only what's good enough. What this means is that now in life you have more choices than ever before, but if you uh, look at all the different options, you may make a good choice, but you actually feel worse about it. This is called maximizing, where you try to make the ultimate decision by weighing every bit of information and trying to make the ultimate choice. You may make a good choice, but you'll feel miserable. Whereas on the other hand, if you do something called satisficing, where you just quickly look at a few different options, choose one and decide to stick with it, you'll actually be happier. This is why you're also happier if you pay less attention to what others are doing. <laughs> and uh, you'll also be happier if you learn to lower your expectations of any given choice. No one thing is going to make you ultimately happy. So, seek only what's good enough. Next, learn to embrace limits. So we all know that having some choice is good, of course, but every choice that you make causes a little mental pain and anguish, right? Every time you have to decide something, it takes some effort, a little bit of mental anguish. So some choice is good, but it doesn't mean that more choice is better. We found that we're happier when some people, um, oh, the back arrow works, uh, we're find people are happier when some choices are made for them. That's why when you're at the doctor's office and if you're really sick, you don't want the doctor to say, I don't know, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> you need the doctor to tell you what he thinks you should do. Same reason that some people go to investment advisors to say, tell me what to invest in. We want some people to make some choices for us. It takes away some of that anguish. It's part of the appeal of religion. It kind of says, follow these rules, and if you follow the rules, kind of half of your life decisions are made for you. Same thing with having a circle of friends, uh, a family, or a place that you call home. Each one of these limits your choices in some way, which surprisingly makes you happier. So learn to embrace limits, and lastly, learn to distinguish between what's important and what's urgent. So a lot of us spend a lot of our time in emails and messages and SMSs, all of them somebody else has decided is urgent, but none of these are important. None of these will change your life. What's important 
is spending, say, 100 hours in deep practice learning a new skill that could bring your career to the next level. What's important is giving your full attention to a friend or a child or even a, a potential new business partner to develop a relationship. What's important, as you know, is to get outside and to exercise and get a good night's sleep and to slowly eat a meal of real food, but none of these things will ever be urgent. So distinguish between what's important and what's urgent, let go of the things that other people call urgent, and focus on what's important. So what do you think? Life is choice. So life is all about choice. Pretty good argument, right? Okay. What other word do you think could go there? Somebody shout out something again. Fun? What else? Change? Good one. Let's try life is time. Life is all about time. Life is measured between the short amount of time, between when you're born, I guess the first time you cry, and when you die. So if life is all about time, how can you use your time wisely? Here's some ideas. First is to remember it's limited. Whenever something is, uh, you have limits on something, it enhances your appreciation of it. So if you had an old friend that you hadn't seen in a long time, and you had just one hour with your old friend, you would make the best of that hour and quickly catch up and really appreciate that hour. If you have only one week to see a country, you'll go see it with a kind of intensity and vigor. And lastly, if you were to find out right now, check your messages, and it says, you have one year to live, <laughs> you will, I guess that would be an important message, sorry. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, you would make the best of that year. That is the best way to make use of your time, is to remember that it's limited. Next, it's important to be mostly future-focused. Not entirely, but mostly. Those of you that are TED fans have probably heard about the marshmallow test, right? Where a bunch of four-year-olds were brought into a room, one at a time, and they were given one marshmallow, and they were told, if you can wait a few minutes without eating that marshmallow, we'll give you two marshmallows. And around the world, 70% of the kids could not wait. They eat the marshmallow right away. But 30% waited. By the way, if you're interested in this, it's fascinating. Like, go to TED.com and look for the marshmallow. Um, they give a detailed talk about it. So, Worldwide, 30% of the kids waited a few minutes for the second marshmallow. But what's fascinating is that 15 years later, they went back to all those kids to see how they were doing. And across the board, that 30% that waited for the second marshmallow, when they were only four years old, um, had done 300 points better on the SAT test. They were better academically, they were better professionally. They were even generally more balanced, happy, healthy people. So this is kind of the essence of uh, delayed gratification is this idea of doing a favor to your future self, right? So you're investing in your future self. So this is what future-focused people are all about. Um, anytime they do these studies, people that are very future-focused are more successful academically and professionally. They tend to exercise more and eat better because they're always thinking of their future. But if you do it too much, it hurts things that require a present focus. So you need to be somewhat present-focused for things like relationships, being in the present with somebody, uh, like being in the moment and really being there. Uh, art and creativity require a present focus. People who are very present focused are the best at helping others. They're generally more compassionate, but they're often the worst at helping themselves. Because if you're living just for today, your bank account is notoriously empty, you don't do things like, you know, brush your teeth all the time, and uh, you might not invest your time into future skills and all that. So it's important to be somewhat present focused, uh, not too much, but also somewhat past-focused, because if you can remember the past, is like living twice. And if you learn to rewrite your past, by, I mean, uh, with your current wisdom, look back at past events in your life, remember them, and look at them again with your newfound wisdom, you re realize that you can reinterpret your past, which lets you know that you can write your future. So it's important to be somewhat past-focused, um, oh, also to remember the context and the bigger picture of where you're at in your life. And lastly, the importance of getting into the zone. Whenever they do these tests on happiness and they find out what makes people happy, more than chocolate, more than sex, the thing that makes people happy is the state that they call flow, which is complete immersion in what you're doing, being lost in your work. Uh, part of the way to do this is to have tasks that have really clear goals, clear outcomes, to love the process like it's a game. So not be doing something just for the result, but to just love the process while you're doing it and to do something that is challenging, but not too challenging. If it's too easy, you lose interest, your brain wanders. And then when you do find something like that, learn to eliminate all the distractions and just let yourself get lost in it completely and let the world melt away. So, 
Life is time. Life is all about time. What else could we put there? One other word, shout out anything? Okay. <laughs> Short. Good one. <laughs> Maybe that's just you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, what if you say life is memory? Um, because everything we're talking about here is subjective, right? So if you can't remember it, it's like it never happened. So you know that strange feeling when somebody says, hey, what did you do yesterday? And you say, I, I don't know, I guess. Mm. So you know that kind of depressing feeling if you hadn't seen somebody in a few months and they said, hey, I haven't seen you in a few months, what you been doing? And you say, um, working, I guess, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> so think of how horrible it would be if in a few years from now you were to bump into somebody from TED and they would say, hey, I haven't seen you since 2012, what have you been doing? And you were to say, I don't know, <laughs> nothing. So I think it's possible that you could actually be a very uh, good person and eat your carrots and brush your teeth and live a healthy long life and live to be 100, but actually only experience a short life if you don't have things that you remember in life. So how can you make more memories? You can introduce lots of novelty into your life. These chronological landmarks, they act as hooks for you to hang your memories on. That's why usually whenever you're remembering something, the essence of remembering is you're hooking something to something else. You remember where you were when you heard this song, or you remember what you were doing the first time you met somebody. You're hanging your memories on something else, so in order to do that, you need novelty in your life. You need to change your routines, get an intentional reversal of your normal things you do. But also, what really helps is to visit somewhere shockingly different, not just somewhere pleasant, but some place that's the kind of place that you ordinarily wouldn't go. Something to kind of get these uh, hooks into your life. And admit it, you can change your career. You could move far away, you could learn a new language, you could do all these things if you wanted to, and you would actually live a more memorable life. So, what else could we say? We could say life is communication, we could talk about communicating well, we could talk about the importance of stories and Aesop's fables. Uh, the reason we remember them is because they're stories, not just bullet points and lessons. We could learn to ignore what people say, because a lot of it's confabulation anyway, and read between the lines and read body language. We could learn to selflessly mirror people in a way so you can develop rapport with somebody by acting like them. And I love this one, learning about cultural translations. So even if we're speaking English, somebody's cultural context can make the words mean very different things. The favorite one I've found out for this new series of books that I'm writing is this word quality. Where I grew up in America, when you say quality, it just means it works. When you say quality, you're really saying it works. It turns out in Korea, they like everything to be new. So when you say quality, what you really mean is it's very brand new. In Japan, when you say quality, you mean it is flawless, it's perfect, it has no mistakes. And in China, when you say it's quality, it means it gives you status. So um, you can talk about being considerate versus meta-considerate and all that kind of stuff about letting people pursue you, but we're not going to talk about that. Let's, what if we were to say life is happiness? We could talk about how to be happy, but that's usually a miserable question because as soon as you start asking it, you feel horrible. So happiness <laughs> is best approached sideways. But what's interesting is that the people that are and that the, what is it, the most closely correlated thing with the people that are happiest are the ones that trust their neighbors. In all these tests of happiness, that's the thing that's most closely correlated, correlated with happiness is how much you trust your neighbors. I think that's interesting. So, there's some other stuff we could talk about, but we're not going to. We could say life is learning, and we could talk about this, but we're not. We could say that life is suffering. Uh, we could say life is love. We could say life is just merely replicating DNA. Shut up. <laughs> So, anybody have an idea what the final answer is going to be? <laughs> Death, good one. <laughs> well, I'm going to pause the story for a second, because a couple years ago, I started learning Chinese, and I get fascinated with it, especially the written part. I love learning these characters and studying them, especially once I found out that each of these more complex characters are made up of little bits of simpler characters. So, the character for thanks is made up of words, body, and inch. So, as I'm remembering this, I make this little story in my head. I think, okay, so thanks means words, body, inch. So when you say thanks to somebody, you are speaking words that gives that body an inch of respectful space, maybe? I don't know, maybe that's what that means? <laughs> it's a nice idea. I like uh, the character for you. is made up of person, bow, and small. So you are a person that I give a small bow to. So that's what that means. Um, the one for name, I think this is romantic. Name is evening and mouth. So I thought, like, your name is the 
the, the words that somebody speaks to you in the evening, they only know your real name. It's like, that's kind of romantic. I like that. <laughs> and this is my favorite one, appearance. Young, so tree and sheep equals appearance. I, I sat with this one for a long time wondering, how the hell tree and sheep equal appearance? And I make all these stories in my head for how, what that means. So what a sheep behind a tree makes an appearance? I don't know. So, <laughs> So I'm putting all this meaning in it, trying to, trying to think how it got this way. So we'll pause that story for a second. Come back to the Talking Heads. Talking Heads were this band from the late 70s and early 80s that had pretty cool music, but these very mysterious, evocative lyrics that kind of sounded like, I don't know, they, they were always trying to figure out what they were saying and why they were saying it. One day I read an interview with the songwriters from the Talking Heads, and they said what they did Whenever it was time to write lyrics, they decided to be artsy about it. They would just write evocative phrases onto pieces of paper and literally throw them into a bowl, shuffle them all up, and then pull them out, and whatever order they came out in is what order they would put them in the song. <laughs> but the reason they did this is because they said, you know, anytime somebody's up there on stage kind of singing the lyrics to a song, you expect that it means something, right? But how fun to play with that expectation and have it be nonsense. So therefore, because we didn't mean anything at all, we're just putting random words out there, that means that any meaning the listener is getting here, they've created the meaning themselves, not us. So, back to Chinese. So I was studying uh, using this uh, thing called Wenlin software, which is brilliant. It gives the whole history of every single Chinese character. And so now I looked up all these ones that I was curious about. You know, okay, let me look up appearance. What the hell is this young with the tree and sheep? Turns out, it meant nothing at all. Because I was learning simplified Chinese and the Cultural Revolution and a lot of these simple character bits were replaced with things that were just phonetic, it was just phonetic and all of that meaning I had put into all these characters was just nothing. It had no meaning at all. <laughs> I had projected all of that meaning into it. It had no inherent meaning. Which made me think, how many other things in life have I just assumed had meaning, actually have no meaning whatsoever? So, for example, what does it mean if you've done something and all of your previous attempts have failed? Does it mean you're bad at something? Does it mean anything? It's like, maybe it means nothing. What does it mean that you went to a well-known school? Some of the stupidest people I've ever met went to Harvard and Yale. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what does it mean if you're a minority in your country? Of course, we project all kinds of meanings onto these things, but they mean nothing. It means nothing at all. It's like tree and sheep or talking heads lyrics. <laughs> So any meaning you put into it is just something that you projected into it, and none of it's true. So, you probably guess where this is going. Life is what? <laughs> Choice, time, memory, communication, contribution. Life is just life. <laughs> it has no inherent meaning. Anything you've projected into it, it, hopefully it's just something that suits you and makes you happy. But if it's not, if you've projected some kind of meaning into stuff that is not suiting you, that's like still making you angry after years, like what it meant when somebody didn't return your call, or what this and that meant, or what it means if something, something, none of it's true. You put all of it there, and you can take it out. Thank you. <laughs>